Welcome back to the Gillette Health Podcast, where we give you tools to develop a balanced approach for health. I'm Dr. Kyle Gillette. And I'm James O'Hara, nurse practitioner. Uh, today we're doing a follow-up to our finasteride and dutasteride video that came out recently, sort of a ask me anything, going through comments and questions that people submitted through social media. Uh, and figure a good place to start is here with this comment that read, did I hear correctly that both of you actually take dutasteride? What do we have to say for ourselves? Well, I guess we have to come clean. We certainly do. It's one of my favorite medications to take personally. Um, yeah. It started off as just a couple of pills that I got from a friend that I found myself using more and more. Uh, it's gotten so bad now that I'm taking it every day. It's just because you know, I noticed my hair loss progression has stopped. I've gotten mm -hmm. clearer skin. It maybe even less wrinkles that may be due to the fact that i'm using sunscreen regularly as well mm -hmm. uh, but now i i just i can't even come to terms with the fact that i might have to stop this i might be addicted to yeah. dutasteride um that's, i'm also that's our clip yeah james's dutasteride addiction <laughs> i'd click that yeah i would click that too and frankly i am somewhat addicted to it as well i'm actually withdrawing from it um i'm on my fertility phase as i've mentioned people love it when you talk about your health on social media, your personal health, whether or not it applies to them. Um, so I guess uh, no secrets from the public. Um, it's a, a casualty of being in the fitness and health community. But yeah, as people have probably noticed, or maybe they haven't noticed, my hair is looking significantly worse to a point where people no longer think that I have a toupee or a hair system. And I'm having way more sebum and acne, uh, not liking that. It's partly the HCG, partly being off the dutasteride. And I have uh, significantly more body hair as well. So not a fan. I've been able to, I had been able to avoid it for quite some time, um, but uh, no longer able to avoid that given that I'm on uh, another fertility phase for now. After I get done with that, I cannot wait to restart my dutasteride. All right. Well, now that clears the air. We can breathe a sigh of relief and get started with answering questions. All right. Uh, first question. Um, a video on different dutasteride dosings and frequency basing, based on individual characteristics, so uh, presumably hypothetical patients, um, would be appreciated from a medical standpoint. Thank you, colleague from Italy. Um, thank you for the comment. That's uh, very appreciated. Um, I believe we responded to a couple comments like this in the last YouTube video. Thank you for all the interaction. Um, I think we noted that in general, if you have low testosterone levels, that makes you a poor dutasteride candidate. Again, dutasteride at a high enough dose, and a very high dose, by the way, is 0.5 soft gel daily, which is the, the general starting dose for dutasteride. So that's the problem. People look at the- The on-label dosing. Yeah, they look at the on-label dosing, and at that point, it's overwhelmed. Um, uh, the receptors to a point, not completely overwhelmed, because we'll talk about the study comparing 0.5 versus 2.5, daily later. So not completely overwhelmed, especially from a neurosteroid um, standpoint, but it's going to have overwhelmed type two in several tissues. So um, good starting dose for someone with a, let's say mid normal testosterone level, um, not desiring fertility within the next six months, um, 0.5 once a week. And then up from there, someone that's on TRT plus, or just someone that tolerates a lower total androgen pool from a standpoint of androgen density or androgen sensitivity. You can talk to your doctor about that. Daily 0.5 dosing is very reasonable. So anywhere between once a week and daily dosing. Yeah. And I don't have any great data to back this up, but personally, I think there is something <laughs> to be said about slowly lowering that DHT rather than going from a normal DHT, whatever your baseline is down to 10% what that level is. So Personally, I tend to start people with less frequent regimens and then sort of increase intensity mm -hmm. over time, assuming things are going well, no side effects, getting the desired outcome. So anywhere between, you know, once a week, to even once every 10 days in some yep. cases I, uh, would all yep. be reasonable. Yeah, pretty frequently once every 10 days, once every 14 days, I start individuals at that. If they've ever had a hypogonadal symptom, then I start in extremely low doses. I try to... Um, avoid stacking with other 5-alpha reductase inhibitors in that case. That way it's just the dutasteride they're exposed to. Uh, let's say they just, uh, they haven't had ED, but they haven't had optimal 
sexual health or erectile quality or whatnot in the past, um, even that would be an indication to start at an ultra low dose once every 10 days. Yeah, I think those are great points. Next, we have a uh, topical dutasteride review would be very beneficial as it's not a study in the literature. That's true. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would be nice to hear if any of your patients see a success. I, the second part of that is fairly easy to answer. And many of our patients have seen success. Yes. Um, it's not drastic like uh, topical minoxidil where you see X increase in hair volume over a three month time period, but it's gonna be about on par with what you would see in like, systemic therapy mm -hmm. where the majority of patients, probably north of 80%, see some stabilization yes. in the first year. And then I'd say probably 50 to two thirds of patients, 50% to two thirds are gonna see an improvement or some regrowth in that first 12 months. And we know that process can continue out to even probably two and three years after starting something like that. Yep. I don't think it's quite as potent as a systemic dutasteride. Even dutasteride mesotherapy, I, I think they are somewhere in the realm of like, you know, six to 12 hairs per square centimeter regrowth. Yep. Whereas you can see, you know, north you know, 20, 40, 50, depending on how many things you're combining with a systemic oral 5 alpha reductase inhibitor. Yes. And this is a very common question, and there's very common related questions. So maybe we'll timestamp it and then just link people to this video whenever they ask in the future. Um, but uh, we do appreciate all the questions. It's, it's all good for the algorithm. So with topical dutasteride, that is, um, to us, that means solutions and foams, non-sterile. We have prescribed a lot of topical dutasteride and had fantastic patient responses. Keep in mind that, um, and on the Huberman podcast, this is probably another question that we're skipping to. Um, I mentioned that dutasteride has a dose-dependent half-life, which can be very fast. So one of the positives of a topical dutasteride solution and indeed mesotherapy, which we do here at the clinic as well, which is injectable sterile dutasteride, um, the half-life is similar to the half-life of Tylenol or uh, aspirin. So that's where you have different order of pharmacokinetics. People, uh, scientists and clinicians might be familiar with zero order versus fir first order. And once you've overwhelmed that first fast metabolizing system, then that backup system metabolizes very slowly. And for dutasteride, that appears to be around 0.05 to 0.1 mg per day. So if you take 0.5 once to twice a week, then most of that is metabolized by that very fast metabolizing system. And we know that from single dose studies where 0.01 is not even detectable. If people look through my Instagram, I've posted lots of pharmacokinetic charts for dutasteride at different doses. The 0.01 was so fast, they didn't even have it. The 0.1 was something like one day. The 0.05 was something like, th I think a three day half-life. Um, of course, that can also reach steady state if you take it every three and a half days. But just keep in mind that um, dutasteride does not have a flat, steady 12 week half-life. Uh, hopefully we have permanently busted that misconception. Yeah, it's definitely something to think about. And I mean, pharmacokinetics, I think people that are prescribing this or patients that just want to understand better, like what medications are putting in their body and how is this affecting things? The pharmacokinetics and some of those charts there can be a great tool for kind of visualizing this process. Mm -hmm. uh, next, we have, I guess, in a similar vein here, uh, very informative. So thank you for the kind comment there. They said, do you need to front load dutasteride at 0 0.5 milligrams per day to reach steady state? after three months, or can you just start at half of a half milligram per week? Well, I, I wouldn't recommend compounded dutasteride or splitting the dutasteride mm -hmm. gel caps, um, but you could certainly front load, probably not with a half milligram per day, but if you did a, you know, say two and a half milligram dose, that would be a front load, but it's not really needed. It's not gonna no. change where you're at 12 weeks down the road. Yeah, in general, we don't recommend this um, from a uh, from a standpoint of reaching steady state faster. It is certainly reasonable. So with a lot of medications, we definitely do this. Uh, for example, antibiotics in the hospital in some cases, depending on if they're concentration or steady state dependent. Antibiotics, again, um, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics matter. Um, so for some things, yeah, you definitely want to reach that steady state as fast as possible. 
Not the case in dutasteride. That'll give your body more time to upregulate androgen receptor density in specific tissues. Um, and it'll just give you a better idea of tolerability. You know, this is sort of the opposite scenario of what we outlined in terms of like trying to ensure <laughs> minimizing side effects. Front loading would be a way to like definitely draw out more side effects up yep. front because you're going from that high level to relatively low level very quickly and giving very, very high doses. Next question. Thanks for the info. I've been on 0.5 milligrams finasteride for about a year. Maybe hair shedding has decreased about half or so. Um, perhaps this is a normal level. Um, there is ways that you can measure this. Uh, we've talked about this in our podcast with Alec before. Um, not sure what to expect in that regard. Um, again, we've talked about long-term studies. There's the one study from Asia, follows individuals out by 10 years and stratifies them by Norwood score. Um, Norwood score three or um, I guess better in that case. So one, one through three um, tends to have more prolonged regrowth. Anyway, in this individual, the hair is a bit thicker as well. Also microneedling more often, excellent, and consistent minoxidil, excellent. So he's on a um, very solid protocol. Considering trying dutasteride instead, not increase, not really interested in increasing finasteride. That makes sense. It also is much more active in the scalp skin. So you're thinking about um, scalp skin versus the follicle and um, what's more important and really both. Maybe I should stay on finasteride 0.5 and microneedle more consistently. Um, maybe I'm a head case. No, probably not. <laughs> this is a very reasonable Careful question. Careful consideration of your options. Yeah. Yeah. Reasonable. Um, rather be a Jason Statham bro than go heavy on prescriptions. Um, yet, uh, this is another good case for individualized medicine. I guess you could say that for most answers like this. But if I was in a situation that is similar, uh, which I suppose you could say I am. Uh, I've gotten excellent regrowth, uh, much better than half, um, but uh, I would consider going to dutasteride as long as this individual does not plan to donate sperm or conceive within the next six months. Yeah, and I would just comment on the hair shedding. It, it's a metric you can sort of use. Um, I wouldn't be too meticulous with it. I tend to think it causes more health anxiety than reassurance. So the method that I recommend for a lot of my patients and you know, anyone listening that wants to sort of look at and evaluate their hair loss over a year time span mm -hmm. is probably no more often than every two months or eight weeks. Mm -hmm. um, wet your hair, you know, comb it back or a certain style. You know, for women, they can evaluate the part of mm -hmm. wet hair. And then you can see like, okay, is this looking different? You know, two months, you're not going to see much of a difference. But when you have like six months, eight months, a year of data, you're going to be able to pretty clearly see like, is this getting net better, net worse, or am I about the same place as I was? So that's kind yeah. of a way to think about it. I mean, expectation a lot of times is driven by the marketing. Some of these mm -hmm. uh, companies will put up their hyper responders that got great regrowth in, you know, two months. And then yep. people expect to get that. And it's going to be very individualized and depending on how much loss you have, depending on what your rate limiting step is for hair growth you know, very different results. So just keep in mind, it's going to be a long time frame and consider identical lighting, mm -hmm. progress photos, wet hair, either right before or right after a haircut. That way you're keeping as many variables the same as possible. Using uh, a specific person who's very objective that can also tell you what they think, um, probably not your spouse um, that says it's all fine and you've never had any hair loss issues. <laughs> probably not your gym bro that says you're shedding like crazy no matter what, even if you aren't. Personally, what's really helped me is I see my friend Derek from More Plates, More Dates a couple times a year. And whenever on a staircase, I just kind of randomly stop in front of him and I say, hey, Derek, how is uh, my crown looking? And uh, he'll, he will let me know. That's a pretty good so, method as well. Uh, if that's a method that can work for some of you, I'd highly recommend it. <laughs> You're not suggesting that if people see Derek in public to ask stop. him how their hair looks. <laughs> yeah, so stop in front of him when, when he's behind you on a staircase and then yeah. just ask him. Uh, now, next next we have, uh, appreciate the nuanced medical information. So another kind comment. Thank you for that. He said, do you think literature is demonstrating that oral dute may actually be better tolerated when it comes to sides, side effects? Yes. Easy. Yeah. It, it's pretty clear actually. Um, I've seen a lot of cases of dutasteride causing, um, testosterone to feel lower than it is, but, um, there is much more literature on saw palmetto or other natural 5-alpha reductase inhibitors causing uh, syndrome-y type side effects than dutasteride itself. 
So I'd say not only is it a better side effect profile than um, finasteride for the um, individual who may be predisposed to that, um, it is better than some supplements as well. Yeah, and I think you mentioned this is sort of a repeat question talking about the Dutasteride human podcast and the yep. faster half life in small doses. We can go on down to the next. Um, this was again from the colleague in Italy. Uh, same individual was asking about the Dutasteride being four times stronger, more potent at inhibiting the type two isoenzyme than finasteride. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I believe we linked the study here. And yeah, we linked them to the study. We found we found a typo here, didn't we? Where there was mm -hmm. an inappropriate reference or something that was referenced, uh, the contrary of what was the original study that found. Yeah, we found a lot of those recently and we might even make a series about this. It's like uh, um, shaming the author or shaming the peer review or both because a reference is cited and then you click on the actual reference and it is not the case, uh, it's opposite. Um, and with PK data, this can be confusing because um, you'd think that a higher number or a bigger number means a stronger inhibitor, um, but that's not necessarily the case. With finasteride and dutasteride, the other thing that's kind of complicated, especially for natural 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, the way that they um, got the receptor affinity data, um, some of them look for IC50s, which is 50% inhibition, and I believe it's called KM, but um, the different assays that they've used in the past, so especially old studies, are not accurate. So they've been trying to standardize the assay um, to get this receptor affinity data. But in general, um, and we'll post the links and whatnot in the, um, in the description here, but uh, in general, it is a two to five times stronger um, at an equivalent dose. So think about, uh, and this isn't a perfect um, equilibration, but if you're if you're on a dose of finasteride one mega day and you're on dutasteride 0.5 twice a week, for both of those you'd probably expect a decrease in serum DHT by about 60, maybe 65 percent. Um, those are relatively equivalent doses, but um, they're only equivalent for the serum. So again, back to the post that we made, um, the plumbing. The input is the bloodstream, the three different types of cells. And yes, all cells have, uh, most of them have all three isoenzymes, but at different ratios. But for lack of a better term, think about a type two cell, a type three cell, a type one cell. Dutasteride is much stronger in the type one and type three cells relative to the type two cell. So at that equivalent dose, finasteride is actually a, appears to be a four times stronger inhibitor than um, dutasteride. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good summary. And uh, I guess the short version of that is um, if you're looking at the study, because they did the head to head, the one that we cite a lot is the 0 0.1 milligram dutasteride. It, again, that's not a commercially available product. But if you're taking a half milligram dutasteride every five days, mm -hmm. that's going to be pretty similar. Um, and you get basically an identical reduction in DHT systemically in the serum from those doses and a slightly better outcome in terms of hair count, hair regrowth. So you know that you're probably getting a bit less DHT signaling in the scalp, even though in the serum you're seeing equivalent doses there. Again, it's not a huge difference, but there's a slight edge towards dutasteride, even when the serum levels are reduced in equivalent amount. Yep, uh, that's a good summary. Moving on from that. Um, so someone on TRT can manipulate their net androgens to help minimize the chance of side effects. Yes, just keep in mind you're manipulating the net androgens in every single tissue independently. As testosterone can replace DHT roles once past puberty. Um, testosterone, I, I don't know if I'd say, it, yes, it replaces DHT roles, activation of the androgen receptor. Um, DHT is just more important during puberty because that is when you're developing the majority of your secondary sexual characteristics. Uh, so um, yeah, that's a, a good enough way to think about it. DHT, it's not a pure trash hormone. It helps people that are borderline hypogonadal feel not hypogonadal, but um, it is a mostly trash hormone. So there's your balanced approach for the day. <laughs> <laughs> more plates, more dates, wrote an article and mentions TRT with monitored blood work can cure any side effects. 
And yes, uh, that is a topic of conversation that we enjoy discussing with Eric often. Yeah. If you're on TRT, then having monitored blood work is especially important. And mm -hmm. that can give you clues into why you're having side effects or you know, why you're not getting the results that you think you should be out of your TRT in yep. terms of uh, quality of life improvement and so forth. And that's a that's a goal that we share with Derek is and um, you know we're very we're all very open talking about this finasteride and dutasteride can certainly have side effects and they can cause serious consequences especially if you just randomly start them and you have pre existing health conditions like hypogonadism or borderline hypogonadism or androgen insensitivity relatively then they can certainly cause um, those side effects but. Instead of fear mongering and preventing literally millions of men from taking a um, a very effective therapy to greatly improve the quality of not just their aesthetics but um, the quality of their mental health, mm -hmm. uh, literally reducing the incidence of prostate cancer. Yeah, um, helping prevent uh, left ventricular remodeling, uh, helping improve their skin. There, there's a lot of good that can come from this with appropriate monitoring. Yeah, and I think that's the key. Um, now we have one that says, everyone talk all about these stuff. Uh, what about early gray hair, how to reverse it? Are you 58841, question mark? Yeah, um, a lot of people take are you as an alternative. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence, but there's not enough study. Um, I think we've gone over the clinical trials. In the uh, stump-tailed macaques. Yep. Um, so, uh, yeah, I didn't make it as far as a lot of other molecules. You can see our hair loss update podcast. I think we talked about five or six that are much further along in clinical trials. Many of them in stage three, um, pyrolutamide, um, uh, classcoderone as well, uh, Cosmo RNA. Mm -hmm. um, I, for reversing gray hair, I, it's actually been linked now that intense stress will drive gray hair and white hair formation, mm -hmm. losing the melanin production. So avoiding stress, prevention is going to be much better. Yep. Um, there's some mixed data with melatonin. Um, you know, that's not exactly risk-free and you're not sure what yeah. dose you're getting depending on the company. Um, I suppose things that stimulate melanin could have a theoretical benefit, but I don't think that the risk reward makes sense there. Probably not. I've seen people use topical melatonin, decatalase is another mechanism, NMN and NAD plus uh, liposomal delivery. There's a lot of things that uh, potentially could skew things a bit, but um, prevention in general is key there. Um, and as people know, I used to cut and color hair. There's ways to um, non-root cause reverse. Maybe that'll be our too. first product, a Gillette hair coloring kit yeah. to hide your gray hairs. That would be interesting. Be clever with your background talent for yeah, that one. That could be yeah. interesting. Why is it so hard to tell if topical dutasteride goes systemic? Because at tiny micro doses, it gets metabolized so fast that you can't see any change in DHT. There you go. Uh, so I guess it still does go systemic. Probably something like two percent of it, uh, up to five percent if you have a really um, thin scalp. Uh, you do labs pre and post. Yes. Why can't you tell us what you are seeing? Um, Two out of my couple hundred patients that have done topical dutasteride, I'd say have clinically significantly systemically absorbed it. Um, and in one case, it was expected because it was a very high concentration. The branded or proprietary blend concentrations that have tiny little studies, we don't need to name names. Um, but they're like, oh, get all the benefit without the detriment. It's liposomal or whatnot. Um, uh, I have not seen any less systemic absorption. Yeah, it, it would be most cases clinically insignificant, but there are gonna be some outliers there, um, but nowhere near the same equivalency you see with finasteride. You know, finasteride topically, if it's enough dosage-wise, you're going to get just as much DHT inhibition, 70% yep. reduction. Uh, I don't think we've seen anything close to that with uh, dutasteride, mm -hmm. you know, except perhaps that one outlier that still wasn't 70% reduction. Yep. Something like a 1% dutasteride solution uh, twice a week um, that applied minimally to the areas where you need it most. That's pretty reasonable. Some people do 0.1 or even 0.05, although most of the studies in 0.05 are for the dutasteride mesotherapy, the injectable, and that's the concentration that we, that's, we will use for injectable. Data-backed natural remedies to treat 
Multiple Personality Disorder, MPD. So multiple personality disorder is very hard to treat. Um, personality disorders in general, um, if it is a true personality disorder, you manage the symptoms. Um, but uh, maybe they meant MPB instead. Male pattern baldness, multiple personality disorder, multiple person baldness. Multiple person baldness disorder. Um, I, I assume that they're talking about natural remedies. I guess it depends on what you mean is natural. I've talked about topical caffeine before, um, pumpkin seed oil. Um, is ketoconazole natural? <laughs> no. I mean, it's not natural, but it's on the spectrum of less aggressive. So, I mean, you just because something is natural doesn't mean that it's going to give less side effects. We talked about yep. some of the natural uh, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, which yes. aren't necessarily completely benign. So again, yeah, there's not, there's gonna always going to be less data backing these sort of natural remedies because there's mm -hmm. not a, you know, pharmaceutical funding behind that. And so the study sizes yeah. are going to be smaller, just less data comes with the territory. Next, suggestions for a hair loss treatment I could speak to my GP about not likely to have sexual side effects, numbness that I have recovered from following oral finasteride use. So it sounds like this person went on finasteride, had some side effects, stopped the finasteride, and the side effects resolved. Uh, basically, you'd be asking the question of, you know, why did this person have the side effect from the finasteride? Uh, comprehensive blood work could help to yep. tell a lot about this. This person could get some androgen receptor sensitivity testing, perhaps. Probably couldn't ask their GP about all that. Oh, a GP. Hmm. Yeah, the, unfortunately, the answer to this question is, maybe if you're lucky, a prescription of the 2% ketoconazole. And the ketoconazole does not go systemic. I've seen people start saying that too. If it did go systemic, it would be a big issue. It's an anti-androgen. Um, but yeah, maybe a prescription of 2% ketoconazole shampoo. Other than that, you're not gonna get a lot from a GP. Of course, topical minoxidil, as we've talked about, goes systemic and can increase serum prolactin, which can also have sexual side effects. Uh, now we have a cluster of questions here. Uh, what is the dose conversion between finasteride and dutasteride? Um, for example, if someone's on one mg daily finasteride, we wanted to convert them to dutasteride. Um, I think that we answered this sort of that mm -hmm. 0.5 mg every five days to twice a week would be a reasonable equivalent in terms of DHT reduction in the serum. Probably but a bit better efficacy. Better efficacy in terms of like the mm -hmm. target, imagining that that is hair regrowth that we're after. Yep, probably. And... Uh, you can see our other hair loss podcast for the studies that directly compare different dutasteride and finasteride formulations for hair itself and do hair counts. Um, but yeah, as far as efficacy, probably once a week, 0.5 dutasteride versus one mig daily finasteride. Yeah. And then the question would be, you know, why is this person wanting to convert? You could ask mm -hmm. yourself, you know, maybe if they're, oh, you know, it's safer, or if they're looking for a more aggressive regimen, uh, then you may consider adding a touch of both. Um, mm -hmm. And you may be able to decrease the dose of the finasteride because they, they fit together almost like a Tetris if you look at the way they inhibit the three different isoenzymes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are great questions. Whoever wrote these, thank you for setting them up uh, easy ones. A review of the dosing regimen for dutasteride. Not just easy, they, people can take away a lot from this, hopefully. Minimally effective dose, we don't know for sure, but 0.5 mg every two weeks in general is the minimally prescribed dose, I suppose. Yeah, I don't that think is I would do any likely effective. less frequent than that. Correct. So uh, excellent suggestion. How often and how much can you increase uh, for an individual that might be slightly more prone to low T symptoms? Um, not, you know, like specific symptoms from finasteride, but just generally low T. Um, once every two weeks, once every 10 days, and then once every week. Not unusual that we do that. What labs are you monitoring? Uh, GillettHealth.com labs, hair loss panel. Yeah, it could be yep. reasonable. You could track the DHT in time, not necessarily mandatory, um, yep. but at least ensuring you have sufficient net androgens around would be a good idea. Yeah. Getting some data points from time to time. Max dose uh, clinically studied is 2.5 mg a day in women with PMDD. Um, however, max dose that we generally prescribe, I think is 0.5 daily. Yeah, I mean, the upside of the 2.5, I think it's a very small difference when you're looking at, uh, they may have done like 1.5 or 2.5 in androgenic alopecia. Yeah. But it's really not worth quadrupling or quintupling the dose for like a minimal 
increase in effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Probably be better to add actually a touch of the finasteride rather than taking 5x the drug of dutasteride. Yes. Agreed. Um, utility in checking DHT before a 5AR inhibitor? Yes. Does it make a difference in clinical decision making? Yes, just because it's a pretty strong addition to that total androgen pool that yeah. we've talked For about. For us, it does. For the average GP, probably not. And it doesn't necessarily matter what your starting level is. It's how sensitive you are to that DHT. I've seen people who have a flagged low DHT, and they very clearly have experienced androgenic alopecia. Mm -hmm. DHT may be 20, yep. but their testosterone may also be 350, 400. So I'm not telling that person, well, looks like DHT isn't causing your hair loss. But hey, we need to figure out how to optimize your yep. net androgens before we think about you know, suppressing the more potent androgen that's sort of keeping you balanced out at mm -hmm. this point in time. For the average male, they want their net androgens to be as high as possible with DHT being as low as possible. This is assuming that they don't want uh, prostate cancer. They want to live past 100. They want to have good hair. They don't want to have uh, deleterious cardiac remodeling. And they want to have good skin. Um, let's see. Experience with patients that have had side effects on oral finasteride and did not experience side effects with oral dutasteride. Um, Yes, we've certainly seen this from some patients, but frankly, the majority of patients that um, say they have post finasteride syndrome um, are usually hesitant enough to where they do not start oral dutasteride. But patients who have say, you know, I've just had some side effects. I had a little bit lower libido or whatnot on oral finasteride, but nothing crazy. Um, those individuals often like starting oral dutasteride. Um, I've also had patients who were hypogonadal and on oral finasteride stop the finasteride, perhaps TRT was indicated, they start dutasteride with it and with good results. Yeah, so there's a lot of, a lot of ways to kind of think about that. Um, then we have, what is the optimal dosing protocol for topical dutasteride? Um, I would say something like a 1%, you know, starting off two, three times a week could be very reasonable. Yep. And then there's not necessarily a reason you couldn't use it daily if you're talking about a topical. Um, and again, it's just recommended to space out you know, at least 24 hours if you are microneedling. You know, that's very big in hair loss community now. Mm. Um, so that you're not increasing any potential systemic absorption, which we you know, acknowledge does happen. I think mm -hmm. that um, for a while I thought that it was you know, a almost never situation. And it still seems uncommon that it would be clinically significant. Yes. But there probably is a touch of dutasteride that is going systemic. Yeah. These are great questions. Um, one other commenter pointed out, uh, is there, or do you experience, or do your he patients says, I think he meant experience, to say, I experience. I experience less side effects with salt palmetto plus finasteride than with only finasteride. I suppose when I have taken finasteride without dutasteride in the past, I do believe I was taking salt palmetto. I can't say I've had any side effects from it, um, but theoretically that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, when you look at the enzymes that the saw palmetto is inhibiting. Uh, then we have, does dutasteride have the same more or less of an effect on progesterone, dihydroprogesterone, allopregnanolone levels, meaning does dutasteride have less risk for neurological side effects, larger molecule, so less likely to cross the blood-brain barrier, question mark. Uh, so to that latter point, I, I think the answer there is a, a no, that it can pretty clearly cross the blood-brain barrier. Yep. You know, referring back to the study on PMDD at the mm -hmm. 2.5 milligrams, at 0.5 milligrams, they didn't see an attenuation of the luteal rise in allopregnanolone, um, obviously secondary to that progesterone spike in the yep. luteal phase. So it may not inhibit enough of that substrate to you know get progesterone into dihydroprogesterone in, in the sort of in the brain and the central nervous system to have a clinically significant effect. Um, in a male, that's theoretically different because there's mm -hmm. much less substrate to be converted. You know, progesterone levels are going to be many, many times lower. Yep. So you may be getting a complete inhibition there, but I think it would be about the stability of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also think about things like pregnenolone. I don't know that it's been like evaluated even that dutasteride lowers pregnenolone levels. Um, I know that in men who have been on finasteride for a period of time that I see, they almost always have undetectable levels of pregnenolone, and you see that in the published literature as well. So not a perfect answer here because we just don't have the data to draw from. Um, but I will say, you know, personally, with finasteride by itself, 
I felt like I had a little bit of a OCD tendency that started to appear. So I went off of the finasteride and been on dutasteride now in combination with finasteride and did not experience that side effect. Mm -hmm. So take from that what you will. That's my N of one anecdote. Um, I certainly think dutasteride for most people would be less likely to cause, I assume that's what they mean by neurologic side effect would be mm. things like anxiety, depression, and so forth. Yeah. Um, there's also some models that, um, despite what you would think with the isoenzymes, the amount of conversion to allopregnanolone is actually better on dutasteride than finasteride. And perhaps this is one of the reasons why females tend to tolerate dutasteride much better than finasteride, which we've seen anecdotally in um, hundreds of female patients who probably have uh, half, if not more of our patients as uh, female patients. And a lot of the time, especially after they no longer desire fertility, um, they, many are good candidates for dutasteride as well. Yeah. Someone says, your recommended hair loss protocol for hair loss, besides just talking about each one. Uh, it, this is just a I guess they're asking about cookie cutter medicine instead of individualized medicine. We obviously do individualized <laughs> medicine. I suppose if we had a cookie cutter protocol for someone that had high normal androgens, did not desire fertility, let's say they're in andropause or even they're on TRT, whether it's endogenous or, or exogenous, they have very high normal androgens and they want a relatively aggressive protocol, microneedling, minoxidil, and twice a week 0.5 dutasteride for the right person, stack it with a little bit of finasteride as well. Um, and uh, ketoconazole shampoo, just to balance it out twice a week. Yeah. So I'll, I'll build my avatar now. It's a person with very minimal, very mild androgenic alopecia. Perhaps this person is 35, 40 years old, and they just realize that they are starting to lose some hair. Uh, that person says, hey, I don't want a complicated regimen. I just want to stop this hair loss. I don't want to be applying things. I don't want a needle. Um, let's just say this person has no susceptibility to side effects, uh, optimal androgens. So we're building out this perfect case study, hmm. a great candidate. Yep. I would just start them on a single regimen, single ingredient regimen with dutasteride, probably once every 10 days, bumping up in frequency all the way up to maybe three times a week, because it's a very mild hair loss. We don't have to mm -hmm. hit it with a sledgehammer and then just follow that person clinically. So again, it, in, it depends on the individual. Those are two very reasonable regimens, yeah. but totally different. Yeah, yours isn't sexy and complicated enough. <laughs> Someone might actually follow that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Next, uh, on TRT, what's what is the protocol of oral finasteride or dutasteride recommended, dual objective prostate cancer, hair loss prevention, and let's say skin optimization and prevention of left ventricular hypertrophy, especially if that's TRT plus. You don't want the ventricular hypertrophy, which drug should be tried first? Um, that would depend on the history of the patient. Do they have pre-existing um, sexual health, um, you know, suboptimal st status, if you will? Um, how's their anxiety? Um, what's their, uh, even on TRT, what's their total androgen load? Um, and what is their uh, desiring of fertility? If fertility, like let's say this person's 50 years old, no longer, desiring any um, conception in the near future, at least. Um, probably consider dutasteride first um, because they asked about oral. Um, and again, uh, start once a week, start low, slowly titrate up. If three times a week or even daily dutasteride is um, not enough. And if they're a uh, low aromatizer, they are a high 5-alpha reducer, then uh, slowly add in. Yeah, I think that's very reasonable. Let me say, what should I do if I'm on finasteride or dutasteride and still losing hair eight months in? Uh, looking at micronutrients would be a great place to yep. start. Uh, looking to see if there's other vectors, you know, iron deficiency or a thyroid, thyroid condition. Lots of things can cause hair loss. So basically looking at what besides DHT seems to drive hair loss. Uh, that's a good summary. Can post finasteride syndrome PFS get better with time? Yes, it certainly can, but uh, the, it is a multifactorial illness. We've talked about PFS quite a few times. Um, somebody else asked about managing post-finasteride syndromes in patients who come to us. They've been on the drug greater than one year. The first thing I would say is stop taking the drug if they're mm -hmm. not. I mean, there's a surprising number of individuals who will tell you their story and 
They noticed side effects, uh, but kept taking the medication because at that point in time, mm -hmm. they thought that their top priority was not losing hair. Yep. And then a year down the line, their priorities have shifted. And uh, now, you know, they've eliminated the drug and they still have some residual side effects. Yep. And again, there's a broad differential there. So they have to look at all the yeah. variables. And we should note, we don't consider it post-finasteride syndrome if someone is still taking finasteride. It's a good distinction. That'd be a side effect, right? Yes. So um, the total percentage or the total incidence of finasteride side effects plus post-finasteride syndrome, maybe that is 10%. Uh, that seems pretty reasonable. But we see a lot of patients, especially patients who haven't, um, you know, like uh, stimulated their sympathetic nervous system and catastrophized and they think they have to choose between having hair and having post-finasteride syndrome and they're terif also terrified of stopping the finasteride. In general, that individual um, is higher risk of post-finasteride syndrome, especially with lower testosterone levels, whereas an individual with very normal testosterone levels hasn't even thought about post-finasteride syndrome. Again, we've talked about nocebo before. It's a real effect regardless of um, how it skews post-finasteride syndrome cases, certainly not all of them. But um, in many cases, that individual just stops the finasteride and the side effects go away. That's not PFS. Yeah, I totally agree. And it, it would be, I mean, looking at the data, I think we saw around a 6% in the active group for dutasteride for mm -hmm. like sexual dysfunction. So it's some of the numbers thrown out there by you know, various experts will say that the incidence of post-finasteride syndrome is higher than the incidence of side effects on finasteride. So I, I don't know how the math works out there. Um, I know there's obviously yeah. slight Se underreporting selection, and selection bias. Yeah. Under and over reporting in both, yeah, in exactly. both groups. Yep. So yeah, I, probably more than 6% for side effects. Look at the percentage of the population that is hypogonadal. They, they do not screen out hypogonadal men when they're looking at side effects incidents for yeah, yeah. Not surprising at all. Yeah. Uh, so it says other treatments for hair growth, uh, ketoconazole, topical latanoprost, oral slash topical spironolactone for women primarily. Um, actually, all, well, all three of these topical spironolactone can be used in men if it's carefully monitored. Yep. Um, but these do work. Ketoconazole shampoo, um, I think it works a bit better for women when you're looking at the head to head mm -hmm. and the trial. Generally, most treatments work better for women. Uh, certainly, we've had patients taking topical latanoprost. Uh, and actually, I think this went generic recently. It used to be quite expensive to get latanoprost mm -hmm. uh, like in an eyedropper solution. But now that it's generic, this is prescribed off-label for androgenic alopecia. Yep. Uh, there's not a commercial topical spironolactone, uh, but you can have this compounded at varying percentages. I think the lowest percent that's been verified to work is 1%. And you would assume you get slightly higher efficacy at higher percentages, um, but also in men, for example, you might get slightly higher systemic absorption, mm -hmm. um, which we know is prolactone, a blood pressure medication, but it does antagonize androgen receptors. Mm -hmm. um, Anti-androgen drug updates, um, nothing new from a clinical trial standpoint that we're aware of. Please comment below if um, you find something and we'll review the study. Um, however, as we mentioned, there is now sterile dutasteride for injection from sterile compounding pharmacies. I think there are 503B, if I remember right, or maybe 503A, but anyway. Um, so clinics that are doing dutasteride mesotherapy, like ours just started to do now that there's a sterile product, are actually using sterile dutasteride and not dutasteride from research chemical websites from Europe, other countries, or non-sterile product. So, um, yeah. Uh, if you're interested in dutasteride mesotherapy or uh, just getting an individualized regimen for hair loss consult, or if you just want a single appointment, we do cover most um, American states. And even if it's just um, a set of labs with us and our opinion, we would love to give you ours. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, a slot and a solution for everyone and, and what kind of information they're looking to gain. So we can say, you know, Here's what we think about your labs or someone can become a full-blown member and follow with us longitudinally for other aspects of health, not just hair loss. So I suppose if you have any questions or comments, if you liked our answers or didn't like our answers, definitely let us know about those things in the comments below. 
As always, thank you for your time. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed this podcast and may God give you health and happiness.